Okay, uh, we start by doing very trivial things. If you want to expand a function in terms of, of a family of uh, atoms, you have choice of more and more sophisticated things. When you lose at each step, you lose some property, uniqueness, etc., uh, etc. Et this is all standard thing. You have extension in terms of the frames and dual frames. You have the three standard operators. We are going to generalize <coughs> later. The analysis operator to function, you associate the sequence of coefficients. The synthesis operator, you do the opposite. And the frame operator is just the product of the two. OK, <coughs> everything is nice. Everything, everybody is bound and self adjoint There is no problem. And you have reconstruction formulas, which converts perfectly <coughs> in terms of the canonical dual frame. OK, notice uh, in passing that there is another inner product on the range of C. C is the analysis operator. Sorry. C is the analysis operator. Where is it? Aha, uh -huh, getting weak. Anyway, C is the analysis operator. You have the range, which is in little L2, but it's not necessarily all of L2. You take the range, you introduce this new inner product, and you find out the, this thing is again complete. Uh, so uh, you have a new Hilbert space which is just the range of, of C with this new inner product. We again, this will be generalized later. Now, the problem is that you cannot always have two frame bounds at the same time. Sometimes you can have only one or the other one, but not both. So you need to generalize, and that's why we introduce the object called semi-frames. Upper semi-frames, if there is an upper bound, lower <laughs> semi-frame is there is a lower bound. OK, the question, of course, wh what can you do with that? How far can you go in terms of reconstruction, expansion, and so on? This is the question. I will try to answer this in the most general way. Now, question of terminology, people in the field call this guy the un upper semi frame a Bessel sequence. Five Bessel. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it's, it's a Bessel, Bessel inequality. Bessel in Bessel in okay. Bessel okay. Bessel you cannot call it, uh, you cannot call the guy a Bessel, a Bessel <laughs> function. Of course, you have a problem <laughs> there. And it has, in this case, it has to be total, which is not the case for a Bessel sequence. Anyway, OK, so we start to do uh, things more general. If I you define a generalized frame, so you have a, a set, locally compact, sigma compact with a measure, you, you can integrate on that, call it that x, so it's a measure nu. You have a family of vectors indexed by points in that, in that <laughs> space, and you say that psi, that, that family is a generalized frame if the map from x to the inner product is measurable, and you have uh, this relation. I don't know why this guy doesn't want to... Maybe I'll try the other one. Ah, this one. You, 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 you have this relation where the S is bounded, positive self adjoint, invertible. You don't say anything about the inverse. No, of course not. The inverse, if the inverse is bounded, you are back to frames. But the, the precisely the case with the, with this interesting is the case where the, the inverse is unbounded. Then you can really start working. OK. <coughs> As I said, you have two cases. In fact, in terms of this operator S, the upper case, the upper semi-frame is the case S is bounded, S minus 1 is unbounded, and for the lower case is the opposite. S is unbounded, but the inverse is bounded. So, and of course, there is the worst case where they are both unbounded, but that you don't have much to say. If we take for X a uh, discrete set with the counting measure, we are back, of course, to the familiar, familiar discrete setting. OK, uh, now first we try to look at continuous frames. So we are going to redefine the operator uh, analysis, synthesis, and uh, frame operator in the continuous case. Each time you have to define a domain and see what it does on the domain. Analysis operator is always the same. Uh, to the function S, you associate the, the family of inner product. I see my laser. It's a bit weak. Yeah, but I, I need two hands. Because <laughs> this, this, <laughs> this one worked well. It worked. OK. So this analysis operator will have always the, always the same. OK. The adjoint <coughs> is a synthesis operator. It defined the usual way. And of course, the domain, 
is, is essentially a set of capital F where this thing makes sense, where the, this object converges uh, weak. Every, all integrals are, of course, to be taken in a weak sense, of course. In that case, we are in the frame case, uh, product is S and everything is nice and we have the, the, f the familiar representation of uh, S as the, the product of the two. Uh, C is injective by, by, <coughs> by this condition, so you can you have uh, the, the inverse, well defined, from the range of C into H. So you see you are we have in fact two columns. On the left hand side you have the H, the abstract Hilbert space you start from, and on the right you have L2 of X and you are going to switch back and forth between the two. For instance, we have S on the left and we have another object called G on the right. There, they see you need remapping going uh, both ways. Uh, the range of C is a closed subspace, which means that S mi minus 1 is in fact bounded. And this is interesting, the corresponding projection, because the closed subspace of a projection is an integral operator, which means that the range is reproducing kernel Hilbert space. That tells you a lot of st more structure. You have nice regularity properties, and so that's very interesting for interpolation, for instance. Okay, <coughs> now, as, as we had noticed before, in that case, again, you have uh, on the, the range, you have a new inner product, which is defined like that, and you see here precisely, you have the S minus one, and you go back and forth with C and C minus one, so you go from we are here, here on we are on the on the on L2 on X, we go back to H, apply S minus one and go back. And this you call G minus one, is the product of these three guys. And it's in the Hilbert space we call Gothic H sub psi. And the map between the original H and the new Hilbert space is a unitary map. So you can really go back and forth and nothing will happen. You everything everything is nice. Okay, you can invert on the range because you have this unitarity, and wha uh, what you find is that the inverse is simply the pseudo inverse. It's simply the inverse modulo the coming back to, to the, the, the other set. Okay, and you have a reconstruction, which is the usual formula we have in wavelets, for instance. Okay, now the question is duality. We will have a lot to say about duality. We have a frame, even a frame psi, you find another frame chi and say it's dual if you have a rec uh, in fact a reconstruction formula one in terms of the other and of course the relation is symmetric if psi is dual to chi chi is dual to psi the symmetric relation the question is now canonical dual of course the example that everybody, everybody we know that in, in general there are many many dual frames and <coughs> the question is how do you classify them the question now how much of this can be transferred to the case of semi-frames? Do we still have duality properties? Uh, because duality means essentially expansion reconstruction formula mm -hmm. in terms of the element of the dual frame. So if we have a semi-frame, can we do the same thing? And we'll see the answer is yes. Okay, <coughs> now switch from frames to semi-frames, upper semi-frames. So you lose the... <coughs> the lower bound, uh, this is strictly positive, which means uh, you have only the upper bound, it's a Bessel, Bessel map. Automatically, your, your family Psi X is total set. The map, analysis map from H to L2, that ma maps a function F onto its uh, coefficients, is injective, which so you can compute the inverse on the, on the range, and you have a frame operator, everything is fine. Okay. Now, <coughs> S, the S is injective, it's self-adjoint. The inverse is also self-adjoint, but it is not bounded because, because we, la we, lack, we, we lack here the strict positives, which means that you can go close, uh, too close to zero as much as you, wi as you want, which means that the operator is unbounded. So you have the situation, we have an operator S, which is bounded and nice. Inverse is also self-adjoint, so it's nice, but unbounded because of this uh, inequality. And then you define, as I said before, the operator G and G minus one, which are simply the S and S minus one transport on the other, the other side. And both operators act on the closure of the range of C in L2. So we are on the right hand side, L2 of X, we have the range of the uh, analysis operator, we close it, we have a nice Hilbert space, and those two operators are acting there. 
In fact, they are self-adjoint, they are positive, and by the same reason as before, G is bounded, G minus. Unbounded, densely defined, and they are inverse of each other on the appropriate domain. So everything is as you expect. Okay, good. And then, as before, we have that the range is complete in the new inner product with a G minus 1 here. So we get this, again, this new Hilbert space, Gothic H sub psi, and the map from H to that new space is unitary. Okay, as exactly as before. This was we had in the case of a continuous frame. Now we are in the upper semi-frame, but the same property is valid. Okay, <coughs> and of course this is not the graph normal, but this, this remark will be important later on. It's just the graph normal of G to the minus one half. G is a self-adjoint operator, positive. You can take any powers and, and you can play with this. Okay, we'll, we'll play later. So, what do we have now? We have three Hilbert spaces. Continuous embedding, dense range embedding, H psi is simply the range of the analysis <laughs> operator with the norm with the G minus 1. Now, H0 is simply the closure in L2. That was the closure of, of the range in L2. And this guy, <coughs> these two things, it is both the conjugate dual of that one and the, the completion of H0 in this norm is a G. So the three operators correspond to three norms where the operator starting in, in the middle is G minus 1, 1, G. Of course, you are tempted immediately to iterate and take powers. We'll do that later. Okay, so this situation we have. Now, of course, if you have a frame, everything collapses, everything is bounded, the three spaces collapse to each other, uh, the, the equivalent norms, because G and minus 1 are equivalent to 1. Then. Okay, now, take a general case. First case was a fr continuous frame. Second case was continuous upper, upper semi-frame. Now, no bound up whatsoever. Just a general and, and uh, uh, weakly measurable family of vectors on X. No, you don't assume any bound. You see, what can we do? So we have to redefine the three operators. And now we have to define domains, of course, to be sure that it makes sense. The analysis, of course, is always the same. It's always the uh, the map from f to its uh, coefficients. And the domain, of course, is a set of, of f for which this thing makes sense. The, the, these objects uh, are in L2. Synthesis operator, there's no connection between analysis and synthesis, a, a priori. Synthesis operator is the same formula as before. You take the formula we had and you say this makes sense when the, 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 the integral converges weakly. That's a well defined operator. Now, <coughs> properties, <coughs> so psi, so you always assume psi is a total family. Uh, the operator C psi is always closed. It satisfies a lower frame condition, lower, not upper, lower frame condition, if and only if C psi has closed range is injected, very strong condition. Now, if the function x to the inner product is locally integrable, just a rather weak condition, then D Synthesis operator is densely defined and C is the adjoint of D, only in that case. Now, that is a rather weak condition. Now, if you have, in the, in the case of an upper semi-frame, C, C is bounded, C psi is bounded, so the condition is only satisfied, but in general, it need not be. Can you recall, when you say close means close right, uh, when you say the associate operator is close, I'm sorry, it mm -hmm. means it has closed range? Yeah. Okay, sorry, yeah, thank you. Now, the frame operator, <coughs> as originally, is a product DC. Now, we don't know, we don't know, and in general, we don't have that D will be the adjoint of C. The problem is, we don't know if C has an adjoint. That's the problem. That's a well-defined operator. The domain, again, is whenever this makes sense, so we will the integral over just weakly. Domain of S is, of course, contained in domain of C, C. In the case of an upper semi-frame, they all coincide with H, but in general, there is no reason to, to have that. The problem is that if you have a lower frame condition, you could still have that S and C psi have non-dense domain, even a domain reduced to zero. In that case, C psi has no adjoint, and you are stuck. This is so we have to find condition for eliminating this pathology. This is a condition <coughs> which is in fact rather strong because in the example we have it is not satisfied. Essentially, you want that psi for all the, all the vectors in the, the family are in the domain of C psi. And then you just 
conclude first C is then C defines and it has an adjoint, this restriction of the adjoint and S D is closable and it's closed if only the two coincide. Of course, this is all automatic. The question is, can we satisfy this condition psi i being the band of C psi? And in the example we'll see later on, it is not satisfied. It's a, it's a condition, but... Okay, <coughs> now let's switch to lower semi-frame and then of course duality between the two. That's uh, what we all expect. Lower semi-frame, you have a lower bound, no upper bound. <coughs> That's it. The total set, of course. And then you have <coughs> one interesting theorem that if you have an upper semi-frame, take a total family dual to it, then that is a lower semi-frame. Conversely, if you have a lower semi-frame, you can construct an upper semi-frame that is dual to it. So there is, again, duality with upper and lower. That's what more or less expect. <coughs> now, if you take two upper semi-frames and you want them to be dual, it's impossible. <coughs> they have to be frames. That's well known result. So really, duality is either between two frames or upper and lower. But you cannot mix. OK, so this is just a repeat re repetition of what I said before, just put two the, the three proposition together and you have uh, the, this condition. Okay. Now, lots of open questions uh, and of course impossible to answer in some case. Classify frame dual to classify lower semi-frame dual to a given upper semi-frames. Contract new, new example. We'll have two examples, but it, it would be nice to have more. Now, this is the thing I mentioned before. We have these three Hilbert spaces, which are built on the powers of G minus or G minus one half. The three inner products had uh, G minus one, zero, and G plus one. So the, the this is the essentially the graph norm of G minus one half, one plus one half. Okay, you iterate, you get infinite scale. What can you do with that? That's a question. And of course, once you have this uh, scale of, of Hilbert spaces, there is an obvious formula for using that, this partial inner product space, the simplest example of scale of Hilbert spaces. Of course, we come to that later on, actually for Banach spaces. Okay, this is our first example. This is an example due to Terry Paul. Uh, you have a special coherence set as we to, to the uh, AX plus B group graphs, in fact, wavelets. Now, they're a bit slightly different from what one used to it. The coherence set has this, this, this shape. Uh, those vectors are admissible in terms of, of wavelet or in terms of the representation of the group. If this condition is satisfied, the important thing is that this function S of R, R which is simply R minus 1, you can take R, uh, N equals 1 if you want to simplify by 2 for all R, is essentially the square modulus of Psi. And this should be smaller than 1. And of course, no, no zeros except isolated. But then you compute everything explicitly, and you find that s and s minus 1 are multiplication operators by simply the function s plus minus 1. And of course, if you take all the powers, same thing. This means precisely the s minus 1 is unbounded because this function s is smaller than 1 or s minus 1 larger than 1, and you can go as, as, uh, as far up as you want. <laughs> and of course, no vector psi x belongs to the domain. So it's a nasty example, in fact, in terms of what we have said before. Now you can compute now explicitly the analysis operator, the reproducing kernel. I didn't mention that before, but most of the case is not a function, it's a distribution. This is a well-defined distribution, but you see the, the integral of uh, e uh, x minus 1 times r on the half line, that's a, a well-defined distribution, but uh, which means that you have to play with uh, sesquilinear forms not operators, it's clearly a form because distribution, you can put conditions on both sides of the, of the form. Uh, you iterate and then you, f and then you find everything explicitly. You essentially all is the powers of this function S of R that, that ke keeps coming in. And of course, when you have this such a scale, you always have the question, what happens at the end? <coughs> if you take the ni nice function, you get Schwarz space and Schwarz distribution space. This is a canonical example. What happens here? I don't know. Even we try on a simplest example, we could not identify the space and ask some experts and nobody could identify. So that's a fact. You can do the same thing on the other side with G, it's exactly the same, so let's forget that. Okay, now, <coughs> so, we did, so we had an example of an upper semi-frame because S minus 1 is unbounded. Now let's take an example of a lower semi-frame. This is coming from the wavelets on the two sphere. The usual construction of continuous wavelet, 
Uh, you have this uh, function psi, which is a nice uh, function L2 over the sphere. You dilate it covariantly by d a, a. You rotate it by, by rho a, uh, so in the rotation group. And then again, you find that the frame operator is a diagonal operator. It's a multiplier, multipli multiplication operator in the, in the Fourier space. No, Fourier space means, in fact, space of uh, uh, YLMs, the uh, spherical harmonics. Probably you're the first to have this formula a long, long time ago, <laughs> without the context. OK, now, <coughs> what happens? The, the psi, you have to, to check for admissibility. The, you, you want to have wave. Are they admissible? The answer is admissible if and only if the, fun the coefficient s of l are uniformly bounded. And that, of course, in that case, s is bounded invertible. So yeah, this is fine. Now, you can derive from that the fact <coughs> that s of l is uniformly bounded from below. So they are both bounded. We have a continuous frame. Now, Notice the following th things. D does not depend on, th on the function. D depends on the asymptotic behavior of the, of the uh, harmonic function. And C does depend. Now, the wavelet transform is what you expect. Reconstruction formula is all well known. And then it was shown by uh, Wiyo, Van der Gens, and people in Lausanne that the reconstruction formula is only valid if S of L is simply finite. So there is no uniform bound. There's, it's each of them is bounded. But as big as you want, which means in that case, S minus 1 stays bounded because D is fixed. So we have a lower semi-frame when we expect one. OK, <coughs> now, um, there is another uh, generalization of continuous frame was introduced a few months ago by Peter Balash and uh, uh, Speckbacker, he's a student of his uh, going to, to visit me next month. They introduce uh, a concept of reproducing pair for two, again, uh, weakly measurable maps, no, no uh, special condition. You want the resolution operator. You want it to be GLH, mean bounded with bounded inverse. OK, nice definition. Now, this is a generalization. If you take the two psi equals phi, of course, you, you, you get the definition of a continuous frame. So it's a genuine uh, generalization. OK, now what are the properties of this guy? Well, the obvious properties, like the, the, this one, you have uh, duality means that this guy is one. In case of uh, dual object with dual frames or a pair of lower or lower upper semi frame, you have duality property. It means that this, this guy is actually one. Now, this is, this is where things start. Write the inner product of S psi phi f is a G. This is just the inner product, L2 type inner product between the two C phi G, C psi f. However, in general, you have no idea whether those two guys belong to L2. So it's the L2 in a pod extended to somewhere, some bigger space that you don't know. And that's all the question. What kind of assumption can you make to make this workable? OK, we try to answer. So the question, what is the range of the analysis operator? A priori, you don't know. You alwa they always make a, a very innocuous uh, assumption that this guy actually is uniformly bound. The norms are in uniformly bounded. Most of the time, the norms are actually constant, so you don't care. So well the only thing you know uh, at this stage is that the inner product, the range of the inner product belongs to L infinity, which you don't like, because that's a nasty space. OK, then we can ju just look at the, the name I had before, ta -ta -ta -ta, all the properties. Uh, this is exactly all the, 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 the property I mentioned before, simply uh, adapted to this case. So nothing new here. OK. Now, <coughs> if C psi is densely phi is densely defined, then everything is fine, and you, 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 you can have uh, everything is in L2, <coughs> no problem. The question is, how do you know? In fact, you don't know whether C phi is densely defined in L2. You can have a lower bound because the, the, the inner product with f could be zero. Example is simply you take an L2, you take a, a, a E1, E2, and you, t you rotate by uh, <coughs> phi over 2, and you get an orthogonal vector. So S, S, F, S, S psi uh, <coughs> phi is zero. So this, this, thi this guy is zero. Now, this is in two dimensions. You want to extend this to infinite addition, you take two by two <coughs> blocks, cover a little L2, you do the same thing. So Pathologists 
around. Now, the question you want to control the range of C psi. And again, we know we are extending an inner protein field to something bigger. Of course, the natural framework, if you are used to it, is to, to try partial inner products. Now, there are two possibilities. The first one <coughs> is probably the best is uh, the lattice generated by LP, LP spaces. And the other one, uh, uh, local integrable functions uh, with a lattice of uh, Hilbert spaces. Okay, now these are the properties of the, uh, the LP spaces. You know, if you take two LPs on the line, they are never comparable, but the intersection of the two is contained in LS, uh, every S between P and Q. Now you define lattice operation in the sense of uh, interpolation theory. The intersection is a Banach space with the projective norm, which is simply the sum of the two norms. The union, the sum, is a Banach space for the inductive norm, which is this guy. Uh, if P and Q are between strictly between one and infinity, they are both reflexive and the duality is ex exactly what you expect. Now we have uh, uh, this notation. Beware, in on one side you have the same notation, for the intersection and the union. You'll see in a minute why. Which means that you, are, uh, you take a square, 0, 1 times 0, 1, for 1 over p, 1 over q, and what you get is this picture. Namely, you have 1 over p here, 1 over q there. You take the LP spaces here, the all the intersection on above. So every space is larger than everything that sits on the left or above. And uh, these are the unions, so the smaller space is L infinity times L1, and the largest one is this one. Okay, can you exp exp exploit that? The answer is yes. You can take the full lattice, that's one thing. But you can also extract Banach chains, actually there will be Banach triple, there will be contain Banach triple, uh, by taking, say, well, I, I just with the formula, let's see the picture, it's, it's easy. Okay, this is the picture. You can take this line. So you need a scale that is symmetric with respect to the L2. Duality is reflection with respect to L2. So you have this scale. You take an arbitrary Q and do the same thing. Or you can do take two and do the same thing. So you have an infinite, infinite number of solutions depending on your problem at hand. And I've seen in a recent uh, extension of their the papers, they make explicit assumptions that the, uh, the range should be um, in LQ, in L2, whatever, so which we are exactly in this business. So the idea is to use this to control the range of, of the C. And of course then, the, the, inner part, the L2 inner part is well defined because there are space and duality. So this is a perfect tool for analyz analyzing these things. Now the other situation, I'll go very quickly, uh, it's just L1 log, so local integrable function. Inner product is, of course, the L2 inner product, again, as usual. Uh, compatibility means that the product is in L1. And the th you find a family of Hilbert space, which are weighted L2 spaces. In again, evolution, uh, when the, uh, the weight R should be L2 log, locally square integrable, strictly positive. And, of course, the, the dual is just the inverse. L2 is in the middle. And you have a very huge thing because the, uh, the extreme spaces are L1 log, L2 R in the middle, and L, L infinity of compact support. And again, this is a lattice in an obvious way. These are lattice operations. We have a huge uh, lattice. Generating means that if two objects are compatible, that means there exists an, uh, an index R such that one sits in L2 R and the other one in the dual. And you want to apply that our problem. We have this, this object that by definition this inner product makes sense for any f and g. What would be the, the question to ask? Find an r such that c, ps, uh, c psi x uh, f is in L2 r and c psi uh, c phi f I, uh, c phi g sorry would be in L2 r bar. So again you have to find a, p a dual pair which you can fit your two objects, one on, on one side and the other on the other side. And of course, you, you, ca you can have more general questions because this in general, these L2Rs, they are not comparable either. But you can have a, a, a one which is smaller than this is L2 of the, in the, the projective norm is simply the sum of the two norms. Again here, so you can try to put ev everybody, if you have one 
here one range here the other one there, you can put them both here. So you can ask and one find the R such that those two ranges are there. And questions? You need examples. So uh, there are two possibilities. I, I think the first one, the, uh, first the LP approach is more natural because the natural conditions on those guys are LP type conditions. Uh, this may be n this is maybe not well adapted, but I don't know. It depends. We find an, an example, explicit example where this is natural. Okay, Bus the formalism is there. You just have to turn the crank and see what comes out. Okay, I that think that's it. There are lots of uh, reference. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We can afford one question, I would say. Tu pourrais réafficher juste le, ton, ton diagramme que oui. tu appelles diagramme devant, parce que ça allait un peu vite là. Euh, oui, deux, oui. Deux, trois, le quatre slides avant. Lequel bah, Avant, avant, le recul, ça, recul. Encore, encore, encore. Oui, oui, oui. Et le précédent, et même le précédent, oui, je voudrais voir les deux, là, doucement, voilà, oui, oui, non, non, avance, frère, avance, oui, 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 oui. j'avais mis ouais, les deux sur la même page, mais alors on parle du second que beaucoup plus tard, ouais, non, ça Bon, les... ça, c'est tous les LP. T'es es passé un peu vite, là, c'est... tous les LP. Bon, euh, si tu ne sais peut-être pas, on a écrit un livre sur ces, ces bêtes-là, avec un tra trapani, et cette figure est celle qui est sur la couverture du livre. <rire> c'est un Springer, Springer Lecture Notes, volume 1986. Okay, and th and then uh, the other one is this. You extract, you extract from the whole big thing. You extract scales of Banach spaces, and they are reflexive. If you avoid the the endpoint, they are not reflexive. If you include the endpoint again, you are free. Uh, that's up to you. It depends on the condition you impose to start with. By the way, as you know, the diagram looks very much like amalgam spaces, where you take local and p norm and global and q sure. norms, and yeah. you also have the biggest and the smallest and the diagram is the same, except the spaces are. Yeah, yeah, yeah.